In the last video, we saw that people have been trying to understand the brain for thousands of years, but they could only make limited progress because they were not able to see the brain in a great amount of detail. They were limited by the tools. And this began to change with the invention of microscopy in the last few hundred years. Um, so with microscope, you could uh, see the brain in, in much more detail, but that still uh, did not resolve the problem completely. And the reason was this. So even if you put the brain uh, under a microscope and look at it, uh, you basically find that it's still too dense to, to see anything clearly within the brain. Um, it's just too densely packed and you're not able to resolve the individual units that make up the brain. So that has been, that remained a pestering problem for, for a while. Uh, and the solution was not clear. So, so try to think that if, let's say you were living uh, 100 years ago and you had access to a microscope, what would you do to be able to see more detail uh, in the brain? Uh, let, let's try to, to think about it. So, uh, so I guess one kind of ideas could be that maybe you will take thin slices out of the brain and then try to look at them. Uh, but if your slice is, uh, is, is, is a few micron thick, it might still be too dense to, to see anything clearly within, uh, within an optical microscope. Uh, now, if you had access to an electron microscope, you could uh, go deeper, but that, that technology did not exist at the time. The other uh, kind of thing you could try to do is to maybe um, dissociate uh, or sort of expand the, um, the, com the volume of the brain uh, and, and loosen the parts. But then of course you lose the, the, the detail of how things are connected. So, so there was no easy solution at that time. So uh, to solve this problem of the dense brain structure under a microscope and not being able to say anything clearly, um, the scientists at that time thought that maybe uh, if they use a dye uh, and put the dye in the brain, then maybe that will increase the contrast and they might be able to see something clearly. Uh, but even after trying various dyes, uh, they still found that it was just too, too dark. I mean, it was, it was just too dense and dark. I mean, they could not see anything, um, could not resolve. A breakthrough was finally achieved in 1873 by the work of Camillo Golgi. Um, you might have heard of Golgi's name in the context of Golgi apparatus or Golgi bodies, um, which are cell organelles. What Golgi developed was a method uh, in which he would put two salts uh, in the brain tissue and, and those would be randomly taken up by certain parts, uh, by certain units. And then only those units will be labeled. Uh, and, and because the probability of taking up this salt was very low. Uh, it basically converted a dense tissue into a lightly, um, a sparsely labeled tissue, and then it could be imaged under the brain. So that this uh, sparse labeling uh, basically solved the problem of the dense brain structure. And with that, it became possible to obtain images like this. So this is the, uh, the, the drawing of hippocampus uh, based on an image that Golgi was able to see under the microscope. Um, and, uh, and now for the first time, uh, one could see within the brain regions what kind of uh, the connections there might be. So these all these fibers, uh, uh, these now we know these are uh, exons of neurons. Uh, although at that time it was not clear to them what they are seeing, but at least they could see these, these fibers uh, as parts of the brain. Um, and the way the Golgi interpreted these images was that, um, I mean, to him, it uh, all of this looked like a densely interconnected network with lots of fibers. Um, he could not see uh, distinct cells in there, uh, so he thought maybe the brain is is slightly different from other parts of the body in that the brain is made uh, is basically a, a dense mesh or a network of tissue. But more than Golgi himself, the person who really took advantage of the staining method to make fundamental 
discoveries about the brain was Santiago Ramoni Cajal. Cajal was a Spanish biologist who just had a passion to look at the brains under the microscope and he was also good at drawing so he could draw these beautiful images like the one uh, shown here on the right of what he was seeing under the microscope. And after looking at hundreds of these images, he was finally able to come up with a few insights about the brain. So based on his observations of the brains under the microscope, Kahal found that Golgi's idea that the whole brain is just a single interconnected network without any individual cells was not right. In fact, um, Kahal was able to see that the brain is composed of separate cells, uh, which we now call neurons. Um, and, and so th this idea is now known as the neuron doctrine, uh, which really came up after the work of uh, Kahal. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, both Kahal and uh, Golgi got the Nobel Prize in 1906 for their uh, work on the brain, even though they were uh, giving competing theories. Now we know that Golgi was wrong and Kahal was right. The brain is indeed made up of uh, neurons, uh, in fact, billions of neurons. And although these neurons can vary quite a bit in terms of their shapes or sizes, they tend to have some common components. So most neurons have a cell body, um, which will contain the nucleus. Uh, uh, and uh, then there are the branches coming out of the cell body uh, called dendrites. Uh, these are the branches that receive information from other neurons. And then there is one, one long branch typically that goes out um, and this branch is called the exon and then this branch uh, branches out uh, into exon terminals uh, where this neuron transmits information to its follower neurons. And this exon uh, may be covered uh, by a layer called the myelin sheath uh, which helps in insulating the neuron. So, so far we have seen uh, how we came to know how the brain is organized in terms of various brain regions and uh, down to the level of neurons based on the work done by people like Vesalius and later Golgi and Kahal. Uh, now let's think about how the brain functions. And one of the key things about the brain that we know now is that um, electrical activity plays an important role in the functioning of the brain. And first hints about this were uh, seen in 1780, uh, much before we even knew that there were neurons in the brain, uh, based on the work of Calvani and his colleagues. So they were doing some experiments with uh, static electricity and they were using frog skin uh, to generate uh, the static charge. Um, so the story goes that on a table they had a frog uh, whose skin was recently removed. So the frog had died, but only recently. And uh, accidentally, they touched uh, an object that had a static charge uh, with one of the nerves of the frog. And although the frog was dead, they saw that the, the leg of the frog twitched as if the frog were alive. And then they repeated this observation and others also repeated this observation and, and eventually concluded that electricity does play a role in conduction of nerve signals. Um, later, uh, uh, Helmholtz uh, uh, expanded these studies and he in fact even figured out at what speed the nerve, uh, nerves conduct electrical signals. Uh, and he showed that uh, it was not uh, like infinitely fast and there was actually a finite speed about 30 meter per second or so that at which the nerves were conducting these signals. Uh, in fact, if you're curious, I would encourage you to look up how Helmholtz uh, did these experiments. Now let's look at uh, the drawings made by Kahal again. Uh, so on the screen here is the drawing of uh, uh, a particular brain region called the hippocampus, uh, which is one of the most studied brain regions in, in neuroscience. Um, and uh, you can see different neurons uh, uh, in this structure. Uh, and if you look carefully, you will also see some arrows uh, that are drawn along with uh, the neuron fibers. Uh, 
uh, indicating the the direction of the flow of information now remember that kahal was not doing any functional experiments he was not uh, looking at the activities of neurons or how they are responding um, he was only looking at their structures uh, but probably by following the the neuronal uh, structures starting from the sensory layer he was able to infer that uh, this must be the direction in which the information is coming in and then uh, must be going to the next neuron and then able to continue uh, the direction so this is quite remarkable that with very careful anatomical observations uh, he was able to draw uh, or able to infer uh, this kind of directional information so kahal not only uh, figured out that the brain is made up of individual neurons Uh, but he also looked at the connections between neurons very carefully and based on these observations uh, he was able to come up with two more principles uh, the first one is the principle of connectional specificity which basically says that uh, although there are very large number of neurons the connections between them are not random in the brain uh, but they are actually made very precisely um, and in a particular manner if you compare from brain to brain and the second principle was the principle of dynamic polarization which says that the information along a neuron flows in a particular direction so it's not just like a, a metal wire in which the signals are flowing either way uh, but rather the signal or the information flows in a neuron in a particular direction um, and again as i said uh, he he himself did not do this kind of electrical experiments or measurement experiments but simply by looking at the anatomy very carefully he was able to come up with these very bold predictions at the time uh, which have now been verified by by further experiments uh, 